This image on the screen shows a mosquito that is uh, taking blood from a human. And this is how malaria is transmitted to humans. So to briefly introduce myself again, <laughs> um, I was born in Cameroon, where I have spent um, the most part of my life so far. And after obtaining a master's degree in biochemistry, during which I already started studying the malaria parasite, I moved to the Institute of Molecular Parasitology at the Humboldt University, where I recently obtained my PhD in molecular parasitology studying one aspect of malaria pathology, which is severe anemia. This is an overview of what I will be talking about. So after giving a brief history of malaria and the places where malaria is present today, I will talk about the parasites that cause malaria in human and uh, how they are transmitted. I'll talk about the life cycle of the parasite and once somebody is infected, the symptoms that the person develops, some strategies um, that are put in place to control malaria and uh, malaria diagnosis. So malaria is an ancient disease. It's been around for a very long time and it originates from the Italian word malaria or bad air, which is um, as a result of the fact that in the early days, most people who had malaria lived in uh, swampy areas and the disease was associated with the bad air in the swamps. In the late 1880s, the French physician Laveran discovered the parasite in the blood of an infected soldier looking through a microscope and he actually demonstrated that the disease is caused by parasites and not bad air as was initially thought. Some years later, the parasite was also discovered in mosquitoes by Ross, and this already tells us that the malaria parasite alternates between uh, human host and mosquito. So today we know that malaria is a life-threatening disease. It is transmitted through the bite of uh, an infected female Anopheles mosquito to humans. So even though malaria has been around for a very long time, it still remains a major public health problem, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. This map shows the distribution of malaria in the world and the darker the color, the heavier the disease burden. So uh, most of the burden of malaria is in sub-Saharan Africa. And in 2018, an estimated 228 million cases of malaria were reported, of which 93% occurred in uh, the sub-Saharan African region. Roughly 405,000 people died from malaria in 2018, and 94% of those deaths were in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. The people who suffer more from malaria are children under the age of five, and they are actually the most vulnerable group and they constituted 67% of malaria death in 2018. One of the reasons why malaria is, the, 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 the burden of malaria is so high in sub-Saharan Africa, especially the death rates is because the most severe form of the disease, the parasite that causes the most severe form of the disease is present in sub-Saharan Africa. So as I said earlier, malaria is uh, caused by parasites of the genus Plasmodium, of which five species are known to infect humans. Plasmodium falciparum causes the most severe form of infection. And as I said earlier, it's prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. Plasmodium vivax, on the other hand, is known to cause um, less severe disease, and it is very present in uh, regions outside of Africa. 
such as Latin America, Southeast Asia, and the Eastern Mediterranean, which are the other endemic regions for malaria. Plasmodium ovale and malaria usually have very low incidence and they tend to occur in Africa. And uh, Plasmodium nolesi is known to cause the zoonotic form of malaria. Zoonotic because it was known to, it's a parasite that normally infects non-human primates such as the macaque. And only a couple of years, um, not so long ago, it has been shown to infect humans as well. So the jump from macaque to humans, it's not really very much understood how um, the process is not very well understood, but it is thought to be due to land use that brought humans closer to um, Plasmodium nolesi infected mosquitoes. So Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax are the most common form of uh, they are the parasite that cause like the most, uh, they are the most common forms of malaria parasite. And so this image here is just an illustration of what the parasite looks like in the blood. Um, this is for Plasmodium falciparum and it's just for illustration purposes. Within, in the blood, the parasite goes through different developmental stages from the ring to trophozoite and schizont. And it also sometimes differentiates into the sexual forms, which are gametocyte. And uh, the gametocyte is the one that once ingested by mosquito can continue the life cycle within the mosquito. I'll come back to this later when I talk about the life cycle of the parasite. In most cases, malaria is transmitted to humans by female Anopheles mosquitoes known as malaria vectors. And there are more than 400 different Anopheles species, but around 30 are known to infect humans. And this is a map showing the distribution of the dominant malaria vector species in the world. And um, in uh, Africa, the diversity is not very much, it's not very high. There are three major species that transmit the disease in Africa. But then these vector species that are present in Africa are very competent malaria vectors in the sense that they prefer to feed more on humans than to feed on other animals. They live long enough for the parasite to develop in them. Whereas in other regions, they have mostly um, parasites that do not have a high anthropophilic index, which is the tendency to feed on humans rather than other animals. So looking at the life cycle of the malaria parasite, um, when an infected female Anopheles mosquito takes a blood meal from humans, it injects its saliva, which contains anticoagulants in the process to prevent blood, um, clotting of blood. And in this process, it also injects sporozoid, which uh, from the skin, they go through the circulation and find their way to the liver where they infect hepatocytes. So this is the first stage of the infection in humans. So once, in the, uh, once they infect the liver cells, which are hepatocytes, they develop and they form mature schizont, which uh, releases thousands of merozoids into circulation. Once in circulation, the merozoids infect red blood cells, within which they undergo a sexual replication. And upon maturation, they rupture releasing more merozoids into circulation. So one merozoid would give rise to between 16 and 32 um, merozoids and the cycle continues. Some of the parasites, however, a portion of it differentiates into the sexual form of the parasite, which are gametocytes. We have female and male gametocytes. And Upon a blood meal, when the parasite ingests 
gametocytes within, sorry, when the mosquito injects gametocytes. So within the mosquito meat gut, due to changes in temperature and other factors within the stomach of the mosquito, they would undergo um, differentiation. So the female gametocyte will form an egg. The male gametocyte go, undergoes exfragilation and following a fertilization, a zygote is formed, which leads to an okinet. The okinet goes through the the mid gut, the the the, the, the mid gut, it traverses the wall of the the mosquito stomach, like mid gut of the mosquito, and then it forms an oocyte which matches, um, producing thousands of merozoids, which are released and then they migrate to the salivary gland, and at this stage the mosquito becomes infective. So for a mosquito to transmit malaria, it has to bite humans at least twice. The first time during which it ingests the gametocyte, and then the second time to transmit. So the liver stage of the infection is asymptomatic, and uh, all the clinical manifestations that are associated with malaria occur during this blood stage of infection. So this is what a transmission cycle for, mal for malaria will look like. An infected mosquito upon taking a blood meal infects an individual and the, the sporozoid would move to the liver and where they infect the liver cells following maturation, they release merozoid into the bloodstream, which will, which a portion of it will form gametocytes. Upon a second, uh, upon an, a blood meal, another mosquito will pick up this gametocyte and uh, where the parasite undergoes um, the sexual stage in the mosquito. And then upon a blood meal, it transfers it to another person. And so that is how the cycle continues. Um. So, Typically, the time between being infected and uh, symptoms developing, which is known as the incubation period, lasts between seven to 18 days, depending on the species. And for Plasmodium falciparum, it's around nine to 12 days. And the initial symptoms of malaria include fever, which is like the hallmark of malaria. In addition to fever, people, um, uh, additional associated symptoms include headache. Children usually experience digestive um, symptoms such as diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. And some people experience muscle pain and fatigue. So the symptoms are usually mild, but if not treated, they can develop into severe disease, especially in the case of Plasmodium falciparum. And so um, severe malaria usually involves um, multiple organs in, and it is in malaria endemic regions, it is mostly observed in children less than five years of age who suffer most from malaria. And the major complications that are observed are cerebral malaria, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and uh, severe anemia. So I will talk about each of those um, symptoms. Cerebral malaria is the neurological complication of the disease. So it is characterized by seizures, impaired consciousness, abnormal behavior, coma, and the mortality rate in children is quite high, between 15 to 20 percent. Especially, so this, this is a uh, a pathology that affects the brain. And in case of brain swelling, the death rate even increases. And for children who survive it, some of them are left with lifelong um, cognitive impairment, some learning disabilities, and some mental health issues. 
Acute respiratory distress syndrome, on the other hand, is an inflammatory condition, um, condition that leads to fluid retention in the lungs. So this is kind of a, a pulmonary edema, and the mortality rate is quite high, even uh, when treatment is administered. So in addition to affecting children in high transmission areas, it is also a pathology that is observed in adults in low transmission settings, and also in non-immune travelers following a malaria infection. Severe anemia, on the other hand, is uh, a condition that affects mostly red blood cells. And so basically, um, anemia is known as a condition whereby the number of red blood cells is low or the quantity of hemoglobin is lower than normal. So since it is a pathology that affects mostly children below five years of age, I give here the normal range, the normal hemoglobin range for children up to four years. It's 11 gram per deciliter. And WHO defines severe malaria anemia as hemoglobin levels less than five gram per deciliter in the presence of parasites. So this is actually a drastic um, reduction. And so severe anemia actually has, it's, it's multifactorial. There are many um, factors that contribute to red blood cell loss during malaria. So if you remember from the life cycle, the parasite infects red blood cells, multiply, and at, uh, when it matures, it's it, the red, it lyses the red blood cells, releasing more parasite into the blood. So this already is a process that leads to red blood cell loss during malaria. In addition to this, uninfected red blood cells are also known to be cleared during a malaria infection. And it is thought to be due to factors that are associated with the parasite. And then, due to the immune response that is mounted against the parasite, sometimes um, a decrease in red blood cell production by the bone marrow is observed. So given the severity of this disease, preventive measures have been put in place to control uh, malaria. And so malaria prevention actually involves uh, two major components, vector control and chemoprophylaxis. So far, vector control is the most effective means to, um, to control, to, to prevent malaria. And it involves um, reducing physical contact with the adult mosquito or attacking the developmental stage, the early developmental stage of the parasite, which is the larvae. So to, for the stages that are targeted against adult mosquito, we have um, long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. So most of the mosquitoes actually tend to have nocturnal feeding habits, meaning that they, um, they, they feed in the night and in this case, sleeping under an insecticide-treated bed net provides physical protection against the mosquito. And the fact that it's the, net, the bed net is impregnated with insecticide, it also um, provide, it, it provides a means of getting rid of the mosquito. In the residual spraying, it's another ve uh, vector control method that targets the the um, adult mosquito, and it consists of spraying insecticides basically in the inner walls of houses. And given that the mosquito tends to rest on the wall, on walls following a broad meal, this leads to um, killing the mosquito. And the uh, larvae sites are used to um, target the early developmental stages of the mosquito which tend to breed in uh, stagnant water, swampy areas. And yeah, so spraying those with uh, larvae site gets rid of the early stages and they don't develop into, into adults. In addition to vector control, um, 
management of clinical cases is another component of uh, malaria control strategy. So the aim here is actually to prevent the progression from um, mild disease to severe disease or death. And it involves um, two components. So for the treatment of uncomplicated malaria, in the case of Plasmodium falciparum, WHO recommends atemicinin based combination therapy, which is taken orally for five days. And then in the case of Plasmodium vivax, chloroquine is the drug of choice. There's a lot of talk going on around chloroquine now with um, this coronavirus crisis. So chloroquine is the drug of choice, but in places where um, the parasite has developed resistance to chloroquine, atemicinin-based combination therapy is used. Okay, um, so for for severe malaria, so this uh, treatment is recommended for malaria endemic regions and atemicinin based combination therapy administered intravenously is WHO's recommendation for treatment of severe malaria. So it is um, recommended that it is administered for 24 hours and uh, when the person is strong enough to take the medication orally, then it can be given orally. In addition to management of clinical cases, there's also preventive treatment, which is known as intermittent preventive treatment. And uh, it concerns pregnant women and children within their first year of age. So the aim of this actually is to give them a, a drug that prevents um, establishment of malaria infection. And those are usually drugs that act on liver stages of the parasite. And this treatment is also, um, well, not intermittent preventive, but preventive treatment is also taken by non-immune travelers going to malaria endemic countries. And the aim of it is, depending on the region they are visiting and how long they, they would stay, but usually the aim is to prevent establishment of the infection within the, the liver, within the hepatocyte. So then I would move to diagnosis. Um, the gold standard for malaria diagnosis is microscopy. And uh, usually um, the thick film helps detect the presence of the parasite given the volume of blood and it also helps sometimes for to assess the parasite density why the thin film um, helps to deter to detect the species of infecting parasite and usually so um, before microscopy the blood is fixed and stained with gimsa which is a stain that um, it stains basically the the dna it, it reacts with the, the DNA of the parasite. And since red blood cells do not have any DNA, it enables differentiation of infected from uninfected red blood cells. And so just for illustrative purposes again, I show this image here of um, the two major malaria parasite, Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. They have basically um, different morphologies and Plasmodium vivax, they prefer to infect erythrocytes like younger red blood cells, whereas Plasmodium falciparum, even though they infect erythrocytes as well, they prefer to infect mature red blood cells. In addition to, so I'm just going to present the two main uh, methods that are used in, in the field for malaria diagnosis. And so in addition to microscopy rapid diagnosis, diagnostic tests are also used. And this actually helps um, for the detection of malaria parasite from the blood. And it is used in areas where microscopy is not um, readily available. And it's called rapid diagnostic test because the results are obtained within um, a matter of minutes. And so basically this is how um, the test looks like. 
and uh, yeah so the, the buffer is put here and then blood and so it just works like the, um, the pregnancy test where you would have um, basically you have a control a control lane and uh, depending on the parasite you're infected with plasmodium falciparum or plasmodium vivax you would have a band that is the reaction of the malaria antigen with uh, the antibodies. So basically, this is where I will end my talk. And then just a brief summary. I hope, um, yeah, I was able to convince you that malaria is caused by parasites of the genus Plasmodium, um, transmitted to humans by female Anopheles mosquitoes, and also um, the control strategies so far, the most effective are vector control and the management of clinical cases, and then the most common used, commonly used diagnostic methods are microscopy and rapid diagnostic tests. Thank you.